from the Wynn Resort in Las Vegas. It's theCUBE, covering .next Conference 2016. Brought to you by Nutanix. Now, here are your hosts, Dave Vellante and Stu Miniman. Welcome back everybody. The man, Diraj Pandey is here. He's the CEO of Nutanix. Great to see you, congratulations on uh, this year's My pleasure. .next. Really awesome conference, double in size. Uh, we know all the stats, we've been spilling them all, all week. You. But you got to feel good. Customers are yeah, psyched. No, absolutely. Party last night was absolutely. awesome. Absolutely, in fact, uh, Mark Leslie was uh, uh, talking to me yesterday and uh, he taught me a new Yiddish word. It says uh, Kavel, it's spelled as K-V-E-L-L. -L. And Kavel, he was like, it means you take a step back and just feel the joy. Like, you know, he's like, do you feel the joy? Because he and I met like six years ago, uh, in August of 2010, he was just stepping out of the NetApp board and I was trying to convince him that he should work with us. And uh, it's been six years working with him and uh, he's like, you know, I look back at the two people company that I was talking to back then, it's 2,000 yeah. people now, so we've come a long Lots way. Lots of Cavell this it, week. It's better because most in the IT industry are kvetching all the yeah. time. <laughs> yeah. complaining. Better to Cavell than kvetch. <laughs> so, big fan of Simon Sinek, people don't buy what you do, they buy why you do it. Why did you start this company? Yeah, uh, the idea of building systems is obviously in the minds of all the nerds, you know, they want to build the best, most reliable systems and use commodity hardware, put software on top. But then really complement it with uh, the ease of use part was where the real innovation uh, lay. You know, we said, look, if you can really put the consumer grade uh, design on top. Basically what uh, we heard from the Slack chief architect yesterday, mm -hmm. that you have to humanize clusters. So uh, I love the word humanize, you know, and uh, it, it brought some of uh, the things that I always had believed in to the fore as well, and the rest of the company, there's a ton of people that you think were nerds, but they had this humanization uh, sort of uh, skill in, in them, and, and I think we've just gone and humanized uh, clusters, you know, which were very difficult to deploy and manage, and businesses were lumpy, you couldn't sell it through the channel and things like that, you know, because when you build distributed systems, they tend to be complex. And uh, I think we, we changed the game on distributed systems, actually. You know. I thought Mark Leslie's talk this morning nailed it. He's showing the, the arc, you know, of companies' life cycles, and he showed Oracle and, and, and Amazon and some others, but it, he made the point that these companies made big bets, you know, at a certain period of time. Early on in the life of Nutanix, you guys made a bet about OEMing VMware, right? Mm -hmm. Well, um, we didn't OEM VMware, but uh, about they not were OEMing. Not OEMing. Yeah, whether OEMing. or not to do yep, so. Yep. So, what was that discussion like? I mean, was it a no-brainer for you, or was it a little well, tense? Uh, or? You know, uh, because uh, we are a non-descript product. Like, who are we? Are we a server company? Are we a storage company? Nobody knew how to really classify us, right? So, you know, VMware basically thought that look, we are a server-side company, so we must be like HP's blades or. Dell's blades or IBM blades or whatever, so all server companies, OEM, VMware, so we should be doing the same, and we said, look, we're not a server company. They're like, who are you? We're not a storage company. So I think the industry went through this kind of uh, internalization of who we are, and we said, look, we, we're just not going to be able to OEM someone else's software because we are primarily a software company that respects the hardware-software boundary, so we'll package it as an appliance, and we'll uh, unify the experience and consistency of uh, experience itself. Yeah. So uh, on the stage this morning, you brought up some, some of the some big partners, obviously, the extension of the Dell OEM, uh, hopefully clarifying some of what's uh, you know, happening in the relationship there, you know, Microsoft, uh, Lenovo. That un you know, kind of n not understanding what Nutanix is, you know, how does that impact the relationships? You know, we look at it, you know, last year Acropolis was announced and here you've got announced with Microsoft where Hyper-V is going to be, uh, you know, the hypervisor in that environment, you know, sure. and, and, and your, your progress as a company. Well, uh, you know, we definitely believe in opinionated design. You know, you need to have opinions for your design. Like Amazon has an opinion on how cloud should be built. Uh, Microsoft had an opinion on how every app that Microsoft built should run on Microsoft's Windows and Hyper-V and things like that. But then over time, you need to know that, uh, especially when you're delivering software to someone else, if it's not your own cloud, where you can have a ton of opinions and nobody cares. 
But if you're delivering, uh, you know, things to someone else, if you want to grow the TAM, you need to actually relax some of the opinions, which is where we relaxed our super micro opinion. We, we said, look, if people like Dell, then we don't want to go and do that as well. We relaxed one more time with Lenovo. And the same thing is true for hypervisors too, I think. You know, as a platform company, we will have so many opinions and yet on others we have to negotiate with the marketplace. There's a give and take. And some people uh, who've never seen AHV, they said, look, uh, I want to actually go and probably do something that's uh, you know, you know, Hyper-V based. But now we're talking to them on AHV as well and they're like, oh wow, so there's such a thing that we don't pay for a hypervisor. So it's, uh, it's a, all Hyper-V customers are great AHV prospects for the future as well. You know? So you've said the, implied anyway that this, this data center OS concept is sort of jump ball. <laughs> it's up for grabs, if you will. That, that's a TAM expansion strategy. Um, what does that mean for your strategy um, and your future? Well, if you look at operating systems, obviously they need to have multiple services that run. I mean, there's mm -hmm. obviously schedulers, you know, so like what Mesos and Kubernetes are talking about is one, like 5% of what an operating system really needs to be for a data center. Scheduling is a part of it. There's obviously, you know, in the old world you had memory management and the IO stack, networking, storage, security, APIs, like POSIX APIs and things like that. They all make up an operating system. And then obviously you run apps on top of it. So in the new world, uh, the data center operating system is basically between the bare metal uh, and these Linux and Windows guest or even containers in that sense, right? So there's this layer of software in the middle that really intermediates between the bare metal and the application OS itself. And uh, that, in the last 10 years, was a hypervisor, last 15 years was a hypervisor, that said, look, we'll intermediate access between bare metal and, and Linux and Windows. And in the new world, it has to be a lot more than a hypervisor, because uh, the game on storage has changed, the game on storage, is ch uh, networking is changing very rapidly. Uh, you know, the game on migration portability is going to be a big one as well. So there's new services that need to be offered that now opens up an opportunity for redefining what a data center operating system really means, actually. So one of the threats to infrastructure overall is that there's that, that change in applications today. Um, you know, what, what's your thoughts about, I mean, Oracle owns applications, Microsoft owns applications, Amazon's building a platform for new applications, uh, VMware today, doesn't it's Microsoft, it's Linux, and, and that's a threat to them. If you know, I look at Nutanix. You know, what will that relationship be? And uh, you know, obviously, you've got plenty of room for growth and, and, and TAM there. But long term, you know, what, what is the relationship with the applications? Well, uh, you first need to pay your bills. You know, keep the lights on, as as they say. And Microsoft in '91 was a Office productivity software company. By 95, they were a desktop operating system company. By 96, they, were, they had a browser, an application which uh, you know, they took Spyglass and made it their own. Uh, by 96, they were also OEMing Sybase's database. You know, they're like, look, we need to get into this space. By 98, they had Windows NT and SQL Server in some sense. By 2000, they were competing with Oracle and they had uh, a data center operating system and so on. So I think. Companies, as, as Mark Leslie was saying, you know, they need to have these arcs of uh, lives, uh, life and so on. And for us, uh, in the first five years was to really redefine data management, data services, things like that. Last three years has been really getting to the compute layer and figuring out what does it mean to really manage compute itself. So I think every three, five years, as we are able to mine our own exhaust, you know, I use the word mine our own exhaust, because you need the revenue and the profits from the customers go and uh, invest in R&D as well. But over time, you'll see us go higher up the stack, you know, and that uh, would you know, mean things like application performance management and things like that. And from then on, you know, what happens to the apps, I think um, a big portion of uh, uh, the app ecosystem is being redefined as well. I mean, the Oracle database as an app or Microsoft's apps, they'll also go through a disruption, you know, as people think through what does it mean to build apps for the cloud, what does it mean to build, I mean, this, the cliched term cloud native is something very new, and Apache is a great opportunity. So, I mean, there's a lot of stuff going on in open source. You don't need to reinvent the wheel in a lot of these uh, uh, 
uh, middleware apps themselves, you know. You would rather take those, and we've been great with open source in the last six years, seven years, I think. Mean, we've taken it to the next level. You know, we've taken every, I mean, think about it. Uh, the channel, uh, which could probably never spell this weird systems in the past, is able to go and sell Cassandra and Zookeeper in a box. Mm -hmm. We made that work, actually. I mean, who could have thought that whatever was happening in Facebook's and Yahoo's and Google's and Amazon's data center could now be packaged together uh, and sold at $50,000. And that idea of making distributed systems merchant grade is, was a great opportunity for us. So we'll take a ton of Apache and actually figure out what our future looks like. But you know, one step at a time. One step at a time. If, if VMware were not owned by a hardware company, I've always said it would act much differently in, in the marketplace. Um, much more like a pure pay, play software company. And would, what pure play software companies generally want out of their relationships with infrastructure providers is they want it to make their software run fast, they want the infrastructure to be as cheap as possible, and then eventually they want to suck as much value uh, out of that <laughs> stack as they possibly can. So my question is related to your relationship with Microsoft. Clearly you're helping them run applications faster, um, you're driving costs down, um, there's a big gap between what they can provide with services, management services, and what you can today, but over time, you would expect they're going to want to try to close that gap. Do you think about that at all? I mean, I'm sure you do, but what are you your know, thoughts? One thing, uh, Dave, is uh, this company has never lost sleep on competition, ever, ever. I mean, I'll say this like one more time, ever. Uh, and I truly believe the enemy is not on the outside, enemy is within. I talked about this yesterday yep. as well, that you know, the, the paradox of growth basically is about growth creates complexity, and complexity is about organizational complexity, product complexity, uh, business complexity. You know. If we just sign these OEM deals and we don't have you know, great one-click, uh, you know, delightful experience for Dell sellers, Lenovo sellers, and so on, that's where the real uh, you know, sort of rubber meets the road, actually. The TAM that we're going after computing is so, I mean, large. I mean, look at infrastructure spent, 215 billion in CapEx, software, hardware together. You know, between server, storage, virtualization, networking, compute, all this stuff. Add it all up, 215 billion. There's another 400 billion in OPEX. You know, there's like, there's a ton of OPEX that, you know, people just spend in trying to stitch these things together. So the market, that's why Morgan Stanley's report talks about a 700 billion TAM for Amazon or something. You know? mm -hmm. And uh, in that sense, we have never looked at this being a zero-sum game. You know, all we need to do is do things honestly. You know, so if uh, Microsoft's new vision, because the old vision of uh, you know, uh, what they were doing till about two years ago was using System Center as the end all and be all of all things hybrid, and it's changing. They realized that that design point from 15 years ago is not going to work in a world of hybrid cloud where you have WAN and you have distributed systems on both sides and so on. So they're also thinking of what the new design point for managing hybrid clouds looks like and so on. And if we can actually align on some of those goals, then uh, we'll, it'll be a win-win. And if we think that you know, things like PRISM are being diluted with some of these things, then we'll sit with them and talk about what that mm -hmm. really means and so on. So I think, uh, to me, it's never been a zero-sum game ever, actually. You, know. you, from where I stand, you don't have a TAM problem. You have a big TAM. Your TAM is much, much, much it's, it's larger than any... It's a red ocean, not the blue yeah, ocean. Any, right, any valuation you could pick for Nutanix today, anyway, not, not a TAM problem. Which is maybe why, in the analyst meeting on Monday, when I thought Matt Eastwood asked the great question about the edge. He didn't say IOT, but, and you didn't really take the bait. Uh, but then, the next day, we see a drone. <laughs> Basically, a data center at the edge. Mm -hmm. So. What about that as an opportunity for Nutanix? Well, uh, we let people tinker. You know? I think uh, it's important that we don't question why they're doing, I mean, because sometimes uh, business is serendipity, you know, like AHV, which is now looking like uh, it's a big part of our overall offering. Three years ago, three and a half years ago, a couple of people, we just left them to tinker. And uh, there were, were enough antibodies, you know, people who would be skeptical, but like, why would the world need yet another hypervisor? And we said, you know, just don't touch them, they're upon something. There's just two folks, actually, you know, and both of them happen to be ex-VMware guys. They're like, no, no, I think there's something in here that we're going to go and work on. So the idea of a drone is very similar. I think uh, if we can continue to have 
people like Richard Arsini and go and tinker with stuff, it might open up doors. You know, there are already a couple of conversations happening with some of the attendees who happen to be uh, you know, part of their defense organizations of large countries out, and they're like, look, we need to talk. You know, and this could be a platform for us and so on. Now, obviously, we need to think through what it means in terms of battery technology, battery life, things like that. But uh, opportunities galore. I mean, uh, this is what happens in a conference where you don't know everything. It's actually sort of like 10% baked, and then you, know, you put people in a room, and they're like, oh, all these possibilities are possible, you know, out there. You know. So in, the, in Silicon Valley, you know, business plans, business ideas, they're like screenplays in LA. Everybody has one. Mm -hmm. right? But you talked yesterday about the founder in each and every one of us. Mm -hmm. Expand on that a little bit. Yeah, I mean, uh, the, uh, uh, most people in the world uh, will follow. There's some people who lead. And uh, the folks who lead, they have a certain kind of a mindset. You know, they don't uh, really uh, get too bogged down by the bureaucracy. Uh, they have uh, this insurgent mission you know, and, and owner's mindset and uh, you know, an obsession for the front line. So I mentioned these three things in my talk yesterday, but uh, you don't need to be a founder of a company to have these three things being nurtured by you. I mean, Richard Arsenian, you know, one of the, uh, the, the, the drone uh, mm -hmm. uh, person who came on, I mean, he's, uh, he's somebody who actually is a founder in some sense, you know. Uh, the two people I talked about, Greg Smith and uh, Mike Cooey, they were the founders of AHV. And uh, great companies nurture a ton of founders. Now, at many other companies, only through acquisitions can you do that, you know. It's like, oh, you acquire and you get entrepreneurs and you need to have enough of these folks who create something out of nothing, you know, because that's basically what great companies do. They give enough to people saying, look, you are known to create something out of nothing. And uh, it doesn't always have to be through acquisitions. So what we're trying to figure out is, can we create a culture where even if when we do an acquisition, we actually compensate our internal folks to say, look, this has to be joint responsibility. So we'll definitely pay the folks we are uh, you know, acquiring and bringing in, we'll actually look at you folks as, what does your next five years look like in this company? If we had this joint goal together and so on. So I think the end goal is to seed a ton of entrepreneurship uh, within the company and, and then let ideas just uh, you know, kind of uh, simmer and you know, a lot of these uh, sort of sparks actually become fire. You know? Not all of them will, but enough of them will actually become a uh, big fire actually. So would you describe yourself as not a command and control manager? Oh, maybe the, absolutely the, the opposite of that actually. Right? You know? Decentralized yeah. sort of And it's 80-20 actually, you know? I and mean, there's always a few things in life where you have to make the calls. Um, sure. And uh, it's not easy, it's not easy because, um, you know, if you have to make a large company, you have to let go of things. And, uh, uh, you know, if you look at people like Larry Ellison, from, the, from far, they look like folks who have a lot of control. But if you go deeper, like I've worked at Oracle four and a half years, there's a lot of autonomy, at least in the database group where I was, in thinking through new products, new ideas, why shouldn't we do this mm -hmm. kind of stuff. And uh, Oracle database never acquired any, anything from the outside. Now think about it, the first acquisition they made was times 10. It was a caching product in 2005 or so. That was a 30 years after the life of Oracle Database. It's right. so because there was enough autonomy uh, to go and think and figure out how to be, continue to be the number one. And that pride is important as well. Write know? code, not checks, was what Larry used to say. Yeah. And then, I'll, then he changed it, like you yeah. said. It's, yeah. <laughs> he didn't have religion. Yeah, so I think <laughs> in our company, it's, uh, I mean, it's very flat hierarchy. And I mean, Slack helps us a lot. Yammer helps us a lot. Uh -huh. So one of the challenges as you get larger in a company is there's disincentives for risk. You know, you, we, we talked to Sadish a little bit about just organizationally, you know, from, from a software standpoint, you know, you expect that something's, everything's going to fail eventually, right? You know, software eventually works, hardware, you know, eventually fails. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, how do you as, you, as you scale the company, you know, still keep those, you know, the, those, uh, people trying things, being okay to fail, recovering from those things, and, and, and keep the company growing. Yeah, and I, I think just touched upon that in the entrepreneur, entrepreneurial mindset. Yeah. You know, how do you seed more entrepreneurial mindset within the company? And it just doesn't always have to be acquisitions. It has to be things that 
you give your subject matter experts to say, look, it's okay for you to fail. And you uh, actually praise and elevate failures as well. Like, you know, I talked about this a uh, couple of times. We had a couple of bad firmware bugs in the LSI controller that were, you know, they were failing randomly. They were like um, unpredictable, we couldn't really go and reproduce them and so on. And when we actually got out of it after those four, five, six months, I mean, obviously nothing, nobody blinked, the business, it was business as usual. But when you got out of it, we actually went and thought through what is it that we learned from here? You know, there, there was a, this was a failure over four percent of our nodes, and you know, nobody knew how to really pinpoint what was going on. And we learned learned a ton. We, there was no finger pointing. It wasn't like it was your problem. At the end, we were working with Intel. We were working with AMI, the BIOS company. We were working with LSI. We were working with a ton of different players. Say, so whose problem is it? Which is great because customers saw this and hmm. At least in the three tier architecture, it'd be finger pointing towards everybody. Here I can just say Nutanix, it's your problem, go figure it out. Mm -hmm. So we were able to go and moderate all this, coordinate, intermediate all this stuff, but there was no finger pointing. Failure was not a bad thing. And uh, I think it made the organization more robust. I mean, it is a very popular, uh, or at least you know, I, I love this concept of anti-fragility. You know, the more shocks the system gets, the more the stronger it becomes. Uh -huh. And this is Nasim Taleb's uh, work, uh, in the, and he talks about it in Black Swan as well. Yeah. yeah. That uh, you need to have so many shocks given to the system that it just anneals and becomes stronger and stronger and stronger. Uh -huh. And that is what we want to go and really elevate. Look, people, I think we went from failure to success. And that's what life is all about. And business is no different than life, actually. So building up that <clears throat> corporate immune system. Yeah. I got to ask you, you know, we've been talking all week, so I've sort of taken it for granted, but my, our audience is going to kill me if I don't start, if I don't ask a couple questions about the IPO. You got, you know, the loan from Goldman, 75 million. What are the factors that you're, you, you're, you and your teams, your advisors are looking at to evaluate the timing of the IPO? Look, I mean, eventually it's all about, uh, you know, what's the, uh, least dilutive thing for the company, and what mitigates risk, because we have some big ambitions to go and really work on, right? And uh, we didn't want to take uh, uh, the company hostage, and like, well, just because the market is not ready for an IPO doesn't mean that our ambitions have to be del delayed or postponed. Uh, and the loan was a very simple decision. It was probably even taken in January, not even as late as May or June or something, you know, even though people think it's May or June. It's when the oil crisis happened, when China was happening, and all that stuff was happening. He said, look, we've got to be uh, mitigating risk, and uh, you do this when your business is doing so well, as opposed to, imagine yeah. if 2008 happens one, one more time or something. You know? And uh, uh, you know, that's the decision we made. And by the way, loan is like convertible notes that people actually you know, uh, go and raise all the time in the public markets. For us, it was a actually simple. better. Yeah, I mean, it's a simple vehicle. Cheaper. That, yeah, a simple ve vehicle for, for us from a known entity, Goldman Sachs, you know, they've been investor, they're advisor to us and so on. And it's no different than, look, I mean, I, I bought a house, uh, paid all cash, but then I also withdrew a loan to keep it in my bank. Just because you could pay something all cash, just because you have, ca you know, to pay for something doesn't mean that there's an opportunity cost of not having that money in the bank. And that was a simple decision for us for about the GS loan itself. So the timing is not, you know, just maximizing the, the, the value for your, your investors and, and not diluting the, the company. Yeah, absolutely. Just, so absolutely. Wait because see, you know, we're a company you. that uh, also wants to do an IP on our terms. Yeah. You know, just the way we talked about on my terms yesterday. And uh, we didn't think the market was ready for the first six months. And, and you could all see it. There, was, there were no IPOs, actually. You know? And everybody said Nutanix should be the first one, first one, first one, because you guys should actually open the market up. And Would have been a great buy. <laughs> <laughs> but again, um, and to us, and by the way, I'm split on this. I mean, always uh, being about the long term, you know, be long term greedy. So people tell me, like, look, if we are long term greedy anyway, why does the starting price matter? Either we build for the long haul, or we'll flatter to deceive, and it's no real difference actually. You know, but sometimes it's about well, timing is also something. You know, at mm -hmm. some level. And I was one of the people who said, you know, you know, you never time an IPO. In this case, because we're not desperate for money, like look, we'll do it when the market feels that they can appreciate our product, 
not the Nutanix systems, but the NTNX, the symbol, you know. And that product has specifications, has features, capabilities, which comes in a PL statements and income yep. statements, you know, balance sheet and all that stuff. Because if you take something to a buyer and they don't appreciate that, then it's worthwhile just waiting. We, we do this all the time with some of the large global 500 customers, like, well, maybe you're not ready for us right now, we'll come back to you uh, sometime later. And then all of a sudden, you know, eyes lit up, next time you uh, light up when you meet them next time. So I think it's very similar. We are a seller of a new product called NTNX, and the buyers have to be ready. And the buyers said, we're not ready, we are running for the hills, who knows what's going to happen to oil. And uh, I think it's, you know, slowly coming back. You know, I think the pendulum is coming back to the middle and hopefully it'll go a little bit more pro-growth. I mean, we are a company that's built for growth. You know, we are investing a lot of our dollars back into R&D and, you know, investing a lot in sales and marketing as well. So those things are just, um, uh, you need to have the backbone, the spine to uh, really walk through a crowd that's going to keep pelting stones at you because it thinks you don't deserve it. And that's okay, that's what's called the rite of passage of any company that builds. Once you make it, you know, you'll be idol worship. But until then, you'll be witch hunted, you know. And, 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 and to me, it's, it's the way life is, it's the way, uh, and, and that's why it's called the rite of passage. And either we're ready for it or we're not, you know. All this is a rite of passage when people say oh, the loan, this, that, like, well, five years ago, people used to laugh at our concept of convergence and this and that. They're like, you guys are, this is a school project. You know? Just because these big web scale companies do it, that doesn't mean that it'll ever seep into the enterprise. And you see what's happened in the last uh, 12, 15 months, actually. Mm -hmm. So we need to have the conviction that what we're doing in terms of the business design, in terms of what it means to continue to look for things five years out as opposed to trying to optimize the current quarter. Because we could optimize the current quarter in many ways, many, many ways actually, you know, by trying to pull all the deferred revenue, pay for the current quarter, make our gap uh, you know, income look much, much better, make our gross margins look much, much better. Because all the softer dollars that we're getting from the OEMs, we're deferring it. Right. But imagine if you pulled all of it back, it'd look like, wow, awesome, this is a great company, and so on. So, at some point, you just have to have the conviction, and if you waver too much, maybe you were never meant to be. Mm. You know, so I think, and eventually the conviction, especially if you have clarity and you understand that some of these things are just hard problems. No different than the hard problems of, I mean, we went through Quanta's problems four years ago. You know, we tried to move away from Supermicro, went to Quanta, disaster for us. We learned a ton of lessons, we went back to Supermicro, and you know, good things happened. So, all these glitches and all these question marks and all these you guys will never make it kind of stuff, we've been used to it. You know, and at some point it's just zen, you know, you kind of, you know, kind of lift yourself up from there. <laughs> I like it. All right, Dheeraj Pandey, at the helm, hungry but humble. Thank you very much for coming to theCUBE and thanks Thank for you. having us here. Appreciate it. All right, keep Thanks right you. there, everybody. We'll be back with our next guest. This is theCUBE, we're live from .next. We'll be right back. <laughs>